An Idaho man prefers life in the slow lane in his fully restored antique steam car. Years of neglect almost destroyed a major Idaho landmark, but one brush stroke at a time, the building is revived. And it's one of Idaho's best kept secrets. This huge museum warehouse is loaded with hundreds of historical artifacts. Welcome to Exploring Idaho from one of our state's historic landmarks, the Idenha Hotel. Opened in 1901, this Boise Hotel's ivory turrets and bay windows have seen many changes. Through the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, it has several times narrowly missed major fires. And over the years, the Idenha has hosted many famous figures. We'll show you some of the interesting visitors who've passed through these doors in a moment. But first of all, there is a particular slice of history that we'd like to discuss. It was around the turn of the century that a big stir was taking place on the streets outside the Idenha. Exploring Idaho's Jennifer Eisenhardt is here with that story. Jen? Well, Dee, the invention of the automobile caused a revolution in transportation. Horseless carriages joined horse and buggy on the streets of Boise. Well, since then, obviously, the car has come a long way, but we met a group of car lovers in Boise who prefer cars how they used to be, ornery and unreliable, loaded with charm, and a boiler full of steam. Ron Thurber will be the first to tell you. His 1909 white steam car has a mind of its own. I think one of the first things you do when you start this machine is you go out and you do an exorcism on it. <laughs> From the outside, it looks like any other antique car. We'll take the hood off here so that we can keep an eye on the engine so it doesn't uh, explode on us while we're firing up. But pilot. look below the surface. We've got a good healthy flame in here. This isn't your average engine. You're listening to a healthy pilot right now. Here, it kind of throbs. It's just waiting to say, I want to go, I want to go. After a full restoration in about 20 minutes to warm up, the pressure builds. Checking now for steam pressure. And we'll see what we have here. We've got steam. The air pressure gauge, we have about 46 pounds. This is the steam pressure gauge. Why don't we go ahead and put the hood back on? There are so many things to keep track of. Ron's son, Ryan, helps as co-pilot. We're all set. I think we're all ready to steam and blow out of here. It's easy to see one of these things in a museum. And there's a lot of old cars that are in museums, but it's kind of the end of the road for them. And we take great pride in just being able to have the knowledge of, uh, of how to keep them going and repaired. I'm going to go ahead and put this in high range, I think, Ryan. Okay, we'll get, get her going here. There's only a handful of these cars still going in the entire world. Extremely rare. There's not that many of them around. It is an unusual sight, this antique steamer on modern roads. The car turns heads around every corner. It's good to see something a little bit different going down the road from time to time. So many of the new cars all look alike. It's hard for me to identify one from the other. <laughs> More unusual than its looks is the sound it makes, which is almost none at all. Okay, you come to a stop sign and everybody thinks that your car has stalled. As soon as you proceed, they're quite amazed that there is something under the hood that's actually running and, and that quiet. Okay, here we go. With a top steaming speed of only 40 miles an hour, the gasoline cars of today quickly leave the white behind. But speed is not the point here. The steamer, with its leather and brass and wooden steering wheel, leads the way in style. 
it was a, an event to go for a ride in the car. This wasn't just transportation. This was an event to go out and tour around. And the White Steamer was an excellent tour car. So excellent, it became the official car of the White House. Here, President Taft and his family are out for an afternoon ride. Groups of society women would take Sunday drives, and later on, steam car races became popular events. Today, just finding parts for steamers is enough of a challenge. You used to be able to go down to Western Auto or any parts store and buy them, but anymore, you have to know a good machinist. <laughs> that, that, that's the easiest way I can say it. Ron's friend Dick Gasparotti collects local mobiles. Dick's garage contains the evidence of this addictive hobby. That's the seat for the car up there. This one here uh, is uh, a 1900, has never been restored. Manufactured by the Locomobile Company of America. At the turn of the century, locomobiles were some of the first cars on the roads. Today, it's the second steam car Dick owns. Out back, Dick's fully restored 1901 locomobile shines like the day it came off the line. I guess the thing I like best about them is because there aren't too many around, but I happen to have one. <laughs> this gong was the early version of a horn. The dashboard was a carryover from when buggies were pulled by horses. So they just bought a buggy off the shelf and put an engine in it and uh, put all their gas tanks and water tanks and everything else in it and drove it out. There's a beveled glass lantern, a tiller steers the wheels, everything on the car rings of another era. So I don't scare the little old ladies at a crossing. They are unique and they are a very important part of the automobile history. There's an era that's uh, gone that we need not forget of uh, elegance, of uh, fine trim. You look at this old carriage with its brass and its leather, and uh, there's just kind of, uh, it's getting back to basics and back to the original. Everything's very, very honest on the car. You notice there, it doesn't even have front doors, so you, it's no wonder you're in and out. You're out and underneath the car more than you're on top of it. We had fire in the wrong place, and it's called a fireback, and the whites kind of have those from time to time. But that's the price of driving a piece of history. We're back and ready to go. These steam car enthusiasts say the rewards are worth the hassles. It's just enjoyable. It actually feels like that you traveled back in time a little bit to when life was really simple and enjoyable. There's uh, the, the swish, <laughs> the steam sound is, is kind of exciting. The rewards is just the satisfaction that you are keeping a piece of history alive. It's a lot of fun. And Ron's son Ryan is now restoring his own steam car as well, so it seems the steam car bug really is contagious. And I could see why. Yeah. Jen, did you know it was a steam car that brought soon-to-be President William Taft to the very doorsteps of the Eidenhoff? He was accompanied by Idaho's famous Senator William Bora. Later, in 1907, Senator Bora addressed a crowd of admirers from a window of the Eidenhoff when he was found not guilty in a land fraud trial. There have been other famous visitors as well. Walter Johnson, a baseball pitcher from Weezer who went on to the majors, warmed up his arm in the Eidenhall lobby. It's rumored he broke a porcelain vase with one of his low curves. Another Idaho landmark, almost destroyed by neglect, is making a comeback. One brush stroke at a time, an historic building in Pocatello returns to its days of glitter and glamour. Welcome back to Exploring Idaho. Early in the century, furnishings like these were standard in the rooms of Idaho's best hotels. In Pocatello, one of the best hotels for many years was the Yellowstone. It was known as the Gem of Pocatello. But in recent years, it had become so run down, it was considered for demolition. That's all changing now, thanks to the hard work of one man and the people who support him.
some intriguing sounds come out of the Yellowstone Hotel these days. It's been a lot of work. It took me several weeks just to scrape the paint out from underneath my fingernails to be able to get to this point. The entire inside of this historic building is under construction. Terrazzo's stone floors will soon shine new. Broken plaster molding will be repaired and restored. Rosewood trim will be refinished. And all the walls get fresh coats of paint. And I hope to save all that I can in the historic character of the building. Owner Dick Carroll bought the Yellowstone several years ago in a state of disrepair. The building sat, mostly vacant, the last several decades, and things were falling apart. There was even talk of tearing it down. They look at this building and say, oh boy, that needs a coat of paint. The windows are missing. Wow, that building needs to be torn down. By the way, a lot of folks have said that, but there's too much quality in these buildings. The Yellowstone opened with much fanfare in 1916. It was a grand hotel with fancy trimmings and more than 80 rooms, and it got lots of guests from the train depot next door. Back then, Pocatello was a major stop on the line. But everything is a booming then. I wish it was that way again. Jake Miller remembers those days fondly. After World War II, he worked for the rail line and lived in the Yellowstone. But in them times, you know, everything was a lot nicer than it is now. Details like Italian terracotta trim, stone lion's heads, and hand-laid brick made the Yellowstone a building that's unbuildable today. Well, it's just an old-time building. I mean, I don't believe in tearing everything down, building something new. You know, repair what you got. The people of Pocatello must agree. A restaurant that just opened in the Yellowstone has seen brisk business. The manager says he feels the community's support. Well, I think a lot of people, they, they crave to get back to a slower pace anyway. As you can see in the building, uh, some of the woodwork and some of the plaster and the crown molding, and the, the architecture and the and just the whole feel of the building is incredible. A microbrewery will open on one side of the building and comedy club on the other side. When it's done, Dick Carroll thinks the Yellowstone will once again boom. They should recognize, I think, and I think most people in Pocatello do, that uh, we have a, a jewel in the downtown. We really do. We have so many buildings here that have so much utility and so much life left in them. So many things uh, going for them that people, a lot of people don't realize. They're a link with our past. Uh, some of the structure that you see here, the terracotta and the bricks, everything went into it. Uh, they were built by, by your granddad, my granddad, maybe my great-granddad. This, this town is only, gee whiz, it's only 100 years old. So uh, why not save some of our heritage for your kids and perhaps my grandchildren down the road? The Comedy Club is now open for business, and the rest of the renovations should be completed by the end of the summer. You know, Idaho's history takes many interesting twists and turns, and one of them changed the face of an eastern Idaho town forever. Jennifer joins us again now with that story. Well, Dee, it was late in the 1800s that the town of Idaho Falls got its name. The people who lived there, though, will probably always remember the town by its first name of Eagle Rock. The Bonneville County Museum in Idaho Falls tells the story well. Here in the basement, an entire block of a town called Eagle Rock stands as it did 150 years ago. Back then, people shopped at Anderson Brothers' store where the flour sold in burlap sacks and gumballs were a penny apiece. Idaho wasn't a territory yet, but with enough money, you could buy a good beaver trap and stake out a business. A blacksmith serviced all the wagons. He shooed the horses, too. This was your chair for a trim and a shave at the local barber shop. Back then, a few extra coins bought a first-class bath before a big night on the town. There was a carpenter and a dentist. Idaho's gold rush helped this small town boom, but a few thought business could be better. The petition to change the name of Eagle Rock was written by a group of local businessmen. 
They passed it around and asked everyone in town to vote for Idaho Falls. Time went by. The local sheriff kept an eye on the developments in Bingham County. Did you hear? I can't oh, believe it. The gossip at the dress shop was nonstop. Everyone wondered, would the town change its name? It was probably the attorney who found out first, then called the rest. The dentist, the carpenter, the Anderson brothers, the sheriff brought his gun, the barber came along, and the blacksmith. All to find out that their little town, their Eagle Rock Lock, was now Idaho Falls forever. The people of Eagle Rock, now Idaho Falls, cast their ballots in the summer of 1896. Just an interesting tidbit in Idaho history. And it's a great display. Is it open to the public? Yeah, in the basement of the Bonneville County Museum. All right. Thank you, Jen. And Exploring Idaho will be right back. From floor to ceiling, this museum warehouse is loaded with Idaho's history. That story next on Exploring Idaho. There's a secret warehouse in our state where hundreds of years of history are gathered together under one roof. It's where the Idaho State Historical Museum stores all of its antiques and artifacts, hundreds of thousands of them. And because of the huge value, we can't reveal the location. But recently, museum curator Ken Swanson gave us a tour. This is Deb. This is from the state From house. floor to ceiling, this museum warehouse is chock full of history. Piece after piece cover hundreds of shelves, from turn-of-the-century China to antique chairs to early children's toys. It's enough to make your head spin. But museum curator Ken Swanson assures us every item is recorded and cataloged, and each has its own place in Idaho's history. Well, Ken, I've heard a lot about this particular medical instrument. What can you tell me? Well, it's called a hemovitameter, and it's certainly one of the most interesting medical tools that we have in our collection because it's one of those, uh, really it's a sham, it's yeah. a con game. And it was used in the 30s and in the 40s, but when you open the thing up, including all the dials and all this fancy looking work, nothing is really hooked up to each is other. Is that right? That's right, it's all standalone with a few flashing lights. So you'd get checked out on the hemovitameter and then you would right. probably buy the hemovitameter elixir. You have a lot of medical equipment here. Some of it yes, looks pretty scary, but the old iron well, lungs. Well, an iron lung, of course, that, although it may look scary and certainly was unpleasant for people who in it, it did save lots of lives. Mm -hmm. This one is from St. Luke's Hospital, and we did collect it from them uh, so that we had one. And most of the donations that you have here come to you just like that? Right. We go out and either specifically ask for them. 90% of our, ours do not come in by us asking. People, out of the generosity of their hearts, call mm -hmm. us up and say, would you like? Those donations add up. Ken says a rough estimate on the value of all this stuff is well over 12 or 13 million dollars. But then some of these things are difficult to price. This is a noodle making machine that oh he made. Louis made all the noodles for all the, or the Chinese restaurants in town. And it is from Hong Kong. I mean, they imported it in the 1920s. It's all from China. But this was the big noodle maker. Oh my, it is a big noodle maker. It is a big noodle <laughs> maker. Make big I mean, noodles or just like Well, you had various blades, you know, for the size of noodle that you wanted, well, from a kind of a vermicelli size up to a large noodle. Now this, what is this? This is a cane that was made for Senator Bora and was given to him as a present, and it is made from the wood from Lincoln's original log cabin. Really? So, hmm. Yeah, we, we have a lot of these kind of curiosities that even mm -hmm. though it belonged to a historic personage in and of itself, it has a deeper story, a story behind it. Now these children's boots here uh, are kind of interesting. These supposedly belonged to Jesse James as a child. This thing over here is a real carpet bag. You've heard of the carpet baggers. Right. That's a carpet bag. That was brought to Idaho in 1863. We have lots of toys uh, from the 1860s on up. I think we have 400 dolls alone in the collection. Mm -hmm. Here's an early toy right here. And this is one of Walt Disney's first mechanical toys, Pinocchio, coming out. This is uh, made in 1939. You could do that it's easy well. to see. We could spend uh, hours, even days, in this place. Uh, Every aisle is like a walk here, into the past. 
You've been doing this for, for 18 years. What's most uh, important about a room like this and the history that it contains? Each and every one of these objects has a story. Hmm. And you could go on for days in any one area talking about it because every object you pick up, not only is it important, but from there, you go into the history of the person who used it. Right. You go into the technology that made it. How did it get to Idaho? Why it was in Idaho? You can go into all kinds of directions from that. Always very, very interesting directions also. So each and every item here has a unique story. Isn't that incredible? Now, the artifacts you just saw are cycled through the Idaho State Historical Museum's public displays. So eventually, you'll get to see many of them. Now, earlier in the show, we told you how an eastern Idaho town changed its name. For our Idaho puzzler, can you name the town that was forced to pick up all of its buildings and move? We'll give you a hint. It happened in 1925. We'll have the answer when Exploring Idaho continues. Could you name the Idaho town that was forced to pick up all its buildings and move? In 1925, American Falls was moved to higher ground to make room for the American Falls Reservoir. Houses were trucked one by one, and larger buildings were put on rollers and pulled along a few inches at a time. It took a year and a half to move the entire town of American Falls. If you're interested in more information on any of the stories you've seen in today's show, call for a copy of the Exploring Idaho Field Notes. Be sure to ask for show number 132. Thank you for joining us for Exploring Idaho today from the Idenhaw Hotel, celebrating its 95th anniversary this month. As you take a look at this beautiful old building, be reminded of what Boise used to be like. And we leave you today with some photographs that will do the same thing. We'll see you again next time.